metabolically, it's not just calories in and calories out. You can still help someone lose weight, but you have to layer on all of these other types of strategies to get someone to have their body feel safe enough to lose weight. Welcome to Resolve IBS and IBD Naturally. I'm Courtney Cowie, a nutrition therapy and functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. If you are struggling with the symptoms of IBS or IBD and want to get to the root cause of your symptoms so you can take back your health through a whole person approach, this podcast is for you. Just a disclaimer that the information I'm presenting in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. You should always consult a qualified practitioner before making any changes to your health or medical regimen. That being said, let's get on with the show. So this is part one of a three-part interview I have with my friend and colleague, Kelsey Weaver, who is a fellow functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner located in Oregon. In part one, we're going to be talking about all things related to metabolism and gut health, the connection between the two. I think you'll find it really, really interesting. What I'd like to have you talk on just to start with, just so obviously everybody listening kind of understands who you are why you decided to become a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, kind of what got you into holistic health? That's a great, I love this story. Honestly, it's a great question because I didn't, I think a lot of times people get into holistic health because they have a story that's like, I had this crazy thing happening with my health and I wanted to take matters into my own hands. And that's not what I did. But I think my story would resonate with you because you know me very well. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) I actually started off to keep a like this is I'll give you the short story. Yeah. So I was a single mom for a long time. And as a single mom, you're like trying to just make ends meet and feed your kids. So I became a personal trainer because it was actually really easy to be a personal trainer. Like they hire anyone. So you just had to go in and prove yourself worth. So I started as a personal trainer and I was helping a lot of people who wanted to lose weight. Obviously, a lot of people hire a personal trainer to work on body composition to lose weight. And so I started working on that with people and some people were successful and some people weren't successful. And at the time I'm like, well, this is weird because if it's calories in and calories out, why is this not equating the way that it should? So Mm -hmm. I started going down the rabbit hole of nutrition and understanding macronutrients a little bit more. And yes, calories are important, but how does that work? So I went down this pathway of being a macro coach and a metabolic coach. So I am super fluent in all sports nutrition. That was my, that's really my background. And then I started working on that and kind of let go of the personal training aspect because I found I didn't love that as much. So I started working um, on that with clients and I became precision nutrition certified. We've talked about that in the past and they're, they're awesome went through level one, level two training. And that was great because the success rate of my clients went up. However, it was still an issue because while the success rate went up, there were still people that were not getting what they needed out of the program. There was still holes. So then, you know, and they had, they had symptoms like, I don't know, my gut's weird. Like, this is weird. I don't sleep. I don't know why my libido is terrible. And at the time I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means. (laughs) So it sounds like it's a problem and it's probably in the way of you, you know, getting results. So I started to go down that rabbit hole and Long story short, I went down multiple certification routes and ended my last one now is on with with FDN. Mm -hmm. And of course, now I understand, okay, metabolically, it's not just calories in and calories out, you can still help someone lose weight, but you have to layer on all of these other types of strategies to get someone to have their body feel safe enough to lose weight. So that's really, that's really my story. I love it. No, that's so great. And it's funny because you and I have, I think a little bit different focus in our practices, which is always great because then it makes the conversation so much more interesting. But I think when we work in this field, like I know I tend to get a lot of people with gut symptoms and autoimmune stuff going on. And I love that. But 
almost always, or it's a commonly, there's a weight component to it too, right? Like, I mean, how many women walking around are happy with what they weigh? And that's just the state of our society, especially with the way the food supply is nowadays. Like, I think a lot of people think they're doing their best to eat healthy, but it's so subjective. And, and everybody's idea of what healthy is can always be misconstrued anyhow, just based on all of the marketing and, and hype and stuff around diet. So what's so funny, though, is like I found, too, that even though the weight might be a part of it, it's like a like a second tier to the the first complaint like people will actually naturally start to lose weight, right? Like within the first six to eight weeks, they're like, oh my God, I just happened to step on the scale and it's like 15, 20 pounds came off just like that. And I'm like, yeah. And so I found just the process of trying to get the person holistically healthier automatically like has an impact on weight. I'm sure you've seen that too in your practice, right? Oh, all the time. And in yeah. fact, you have to reverse engineer the entire process because I have I have a little bit of that reputation in my community of, well, if if you need weight loss, let's go talk to Kelsey and she's helped this person and this person. And I I've had to kind of what I don't know, what is the word? Basically de like just change the narrative of what it is that I do with people. So now when people come to me with weight loss being the number one issue, it becomes a re-education for them to say, that is not your problem. Mm -hmm. That is a result of the actual problem. Mm -hmm. And you're going to accidentally, and I put that in air quotes, but people <laughs> can't see that. <laughs> this is a podcast. <laughs> but I'm going to, you're going to accidentally air quote, lose weight, because you're putting your body in a better position to do so. And if it doesn't happen, that's still okay. We have things to uncover. But I I think a lot of times if you can assure someone, I understand that is a priority for you, 100%. We do need to be realistic and know that there are obstacles in the way and we will get to that and it will happen for you. But as we do that, we have to uncover these layers. So it, it's about expectation and it's about the safety of the body. And then it becomes, oh, things look great. And now we can start to explore Sure, let's talk about macronutrients and calories and sports nutrition and how you work out around your exercise. Sure, let's do it now. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I like we're on this topic. So let's just stay here for a minute because I think like there's a lot we can actually connect between the weight loss goal and the whole digestive health problem. Right. And I think that just what I see commonly, well, a couple of things actually I want you to speak on, Kelsey. So the first thing is I think a lot of people with weight loss resistance have issues with proper digestion and or hidden gut infections or some sort of gut bacterial or pathogen load that's interfering with their ability to properly absorb food and then also just be in a more balanced condition so that digestion can work well so that they're actually getting all of the mileage out of the food they're eating rather than some of it getting absorbed and then some of it going to feed bacteria or whatnot. And then that extra that they can't absorb causes this malnutrition, the slowing down in the metabolism, and then it's harder for them to lose the weight. So that's kind of like the first scenario. The second scenario, and I actually have had this come up in my world, which just like blows me away because again, I don't do a lot with like focusing on weight loss, but I've gotten a lot of female clients that are in there. I'd say like typically 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s in cases. And they've gone through that whole paradigm of like the Weight Watchers fad that, you know, was like super popular back in like the 90s and just the whole low fat era. And I've had to do so much education with like a lot of women in that age range around like it's not about calorie counting and you can't under eat and you can't be afraid of fat because if you don't have sufficient dietary fat and healthy fat and you're also not getting sufficient calories, believe it or not, like that's going to cause you to stagnate, if not like gain more weight. So I'd love you to kind of talk about those two different scenarios. Oh my gosh, that's you, you and I are a match made in heaven because um, <laughs> I think that you come from, you know, a different a different side of the coin and but we both we both meet in the middle on exactly where we want the client because my background is 
okay, how are we going to, you know, manipulate their metabolism to make it work, but you can't do that first. So I think what I have noticed a lot with people is, and, and you and I have had these conversations many times, because I think literally every client that has come through me, my practice, you know, at this point, <laughs> because you've had eyes on the case. So it's been super fun to say, yes, this person has issues with weight loss, and nine times out of 10, or even 99 times out of 100. Mm -hmm. There is a problem with the gut and it always comes back to that conversation of, well, if this person is malnourished, their body is under a tremendous amount of stress and you have to work on the gut first so that we can actually get, and I always go back to the thyroid because women love to hear how the thyroid is the master of the metabolism. So if your, if your thyroid's messed up, we have major problems and weight loss is going to be nearly impossible for you. Mm -hmm. So if your gut is not absorbing these nutrients and you're not getting the sufficient amounts of nutrients to your thyroid, Mm -hmm. the master metabolizer, of course, there's everything else in the body. But a lot of times when we talk about just the thyroid, I feel like most women have an issue with their thyroid. It connects with them. Mm -hmm. You know, do you find that too? Oh, yeah, 100%. No, I'm so glad you brought up thyroid because I've just been seeing more and more. I mean, you know that we do GI map, right, for our preferred soil testing. And Mm -hmm. what I love about looking at so many of those tests is that, yeah, I often will see, especially like a connection between a depleted gut microbiome, like what we would call insufficiency dysbiosis in our world, right? And then just down-regulated metabolism. And I think it's this like chicken and egg where, you know, a lot of the clients that we bring into our world, we have to educate them a lot on just how digestion works, how thyroid works, especially if they've been prescribed Synthroid. Maybe they've already got a Hashimoto's or a hypothyroid, like conventional diagnosis, like their TSH has been actually high by even conventional standards, or they've had antibodies. And so it's like, yes, even like an endocrinologist has said, okay, you legitimately have this, right? But what is so prevalent in the conventional world that we sort of spin around and look at differently is just how do we deal with that problem? And so in the conventional world, doctors like to prescribe Synthroid, and that's pretty much the only med that they work from, which, as you know, Kelsey, is a synthetic T4, which is just one component of thyroid. And what a lot of people don't realize is that you need really strong gut and also good liver function to properly convert T4 into active T3, which we would argue is probably the more like important one of the two, because that's the one that's actually going to, you know, bind to the receptors and make metabolism work properly. And so how many people do we see that have been prescribed Synthroid? And then we run a full thyroid panel, which looks at free T3, free T4, TSH, ATPO, antithyroglobulin, antibodies, reverse T3, right? We're seeing all kinds of things out of functional range. And it's like, I don't think this med is actually really regulating your thyroid. So just having to explain to them that like, there's, there's a part that comes down to how well your gut can actually convert and even translate your nutrients into building thyroid hormone. But then the other part of that is once your thyroid's starting to tank, it's hard to get the gut to run right too, right? There's like that chicken and egg component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if your thyroid slows down, people you know, I think a lot of times we think about the metabolism as just literally energy burning. And that's how many calories I burn every day, right? That's the only thing that I think about with the metabolism. It's like, oh, gosh, there's so much more to it. This is so funny. I was having this conversation, like this exact conversation with a client yesterday, and we had gotten a new updated thyroid panel, and it was so much better. And you know, the only thing that we worked on, I know, you know, this, the gut, right? The the gut. It was literally (laughs) just the gut. And so explaining that to my client and, and saying, look, we needed to work on the gut for adequate and, you know, excellent nutrient uptake, because Mm -hmm. we needed the zinc and we needed the selenium and we needed the magnesium and we needed all of these great things that support the thyroid. And she's feeling better. Her libido is better. Her energy is better. Her brain fog is gone. Her antibodies came down to not even existent only by working on the gut for the last four months. And it was amazing. And so I think that when 
we think about the metabolism. I love talking about the metabolism. I love I it. Know, it's good. But when we think about the metabolism, it's not like, well, my metabolism is how many calories I burn per day. Hold the phone. It is so much more than that. And yeah. one of the, I don't know if you come across this with clients, but one of the biggest misconceptions with the metabolism is that it's static. It just stays put. Mm -hmm. My metabolism, because Dr. Google told me when I put in my weight and my age and my gender, mm -hmm. that it is 1200 calories at rest. So that means I should just consume 1200 calories. And then it just stays that way. But I think what we don't recognize this is specifically to women as well, although I don't want to put all women in this like category, but we start thinking we need to consume less and less and less and less and less. And so then we have gut function issues. Plus, we have the fact that we're not actually taking in enough calories to support healthy hormones. Plus, we don't understand that there's an adaptation quality to your metabolism in general, and it will meet you where you're at. And you're telling me you don't understand why we're not losing weight. Let's talk about it. <laughs> I know. No, 100%. That is just so true. And I just think like, I don't know, maybe we have a better attunement to just body awareness because we get into this field. I don't know, Kelsey. I, I definitely find, I'm sure you find this too, that there's a certain percentage of clients that just out of the gate struggle to not be able to verbalize like, this is how I feel or, you know, really just kind of understand what are they sensing internally, Right. But I know if I pay attention, like throughout the week, some days I'm ravenous and then other days I'm like, you know what, I could eat my lunch a little later today or eh, a lighter breakfast did it, you know, and so it. I think you're right, like things naturally ebb and flow. And I think that's just all part and parcel of the conditions our bodies are dealing with on a day to day basis are going to be changing. They change with the weather. They change with, you know, potentially what types of protocols we might be running. If we're going to run a gut protocol that's going to call on the immune system to upregulate to eradicate a bunch of pathogens, that's going to take more energy, right? And so you can't fuel that effort with like a minimal calorie diet. And I think that's. Just time and time again, I see a lot of roadblocks, especially with women. And, and it seems to be the ones that have been through those like low calorie dietary restriction types of like calorie restriction diet fads that happened, especially like decades ago. And it's just kind of like this very logical thing to them where it's like, well, of course, like you lower the calories. It sounds logical, but it really isn't if you understand how the body works. Right. Right. You know, and ultimately I, I've had this, I've had this conversation so many times but ultimately yes it is calories in versus calories out however it is so insanely multifactorial that you we can't predict how many calories we burn in one day versus another day and you said that perfectly is some days you're just ravenous and you want to eat something and most people will equate that back to well did i work out today even if they're savvy <laughs> Right. right. They have right. to be savvy in that, you know, understanding of their body to think about that. But for the most part, people are not we're not going to think about that too much. But when it comes to the function of the body and the systems in the body, you know, sometimes it's, well, yeah. Are you are you pushing toxins right now? Are you are you getting are you killing some stuff that we're trying to get out of the body? Maybe you're getting sick. Maybe you didn't sleep very well and now you're craving carbohydrates because that's the fastest form of energy. You yeah. know, we don't really know and it's okay to not know, but it's not okay to not listen. Are your struggles with bloating, constipation, and diarrhea keeping you home on Friday, Saturday nights, clicking through Netflix because you're dealing with stomach cramping or simply need to have a bathroom nearby? Have you stopped being active and joining your friends at the gym because it flares your symptoms and wipes you out for the rest of the day? How about avoiding social gatherings involving food because of extreme anxiety over food reactions or sudden bathroom runs in public? Or because you are too embarrassed to explain your limited diet to others? The isolation, loneliness, and depression that comes with an IBS or IBD struggle is real and often worse than the physical symptoms. I'm here to tell you that you deserve better than just living with this reality and suffering alone. From a person who has lived this nightmare and come out the other end and who has helped many others do the same, there is hope and you are worth the investment. 
Click the link below to schedule your free 15 minute gut check call. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is like so great. And I feel like even as you're saying all that, it, it makes me think about all of these sort of, they seem counterintuitive principles, but I've seen this time and time again in the gut health world, especially where like, I've had people with like severe GI dysfunction where let's say they've also got a SIBO diagnosis, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, right? And we know that that can also be a factor where bacteria overgrows, small intestine is a site of nutrient absorption that could greatly impact thyroid, right? To clear that, we can actually do a liquid diet called elemental diet. It's not fun. I've done it myself <laughs> personally, like probably twice. And it was, it was rough. You kind of get on a groove, but you know, I've had clients willing to do that. And it's amazing because people will actually put on weight that way. And you might think like, well, how is that possible? Well, because you're starving the bacteria out and now you've got like literal easy to absorb nutrition coming in. And I'm sure someone who's like not in that extreme of like all that digestive dysfunction would kind of look at that and scratch their head be like, well, how is that putting weight on somebody? I don't understand, right? I'm over here trying to calorie restrict and that isn't working. But it just, it's so interesting how it does come down to how, how well you can process your food, what other processes are going on in the body, whether that's eradication, whether that's just general housekeeping, maybe your body's like in a growth phase of some sort, who knows with kids, that's often the case. Right. But like, I <laughs> yep. mean, sometimes we need more sleep too. It's kind of this ebb and flow of just day to day. We're different and we can't always attribute it to like, oh, I did a re really intense workout. That must be why, because there are certain days I wake up and I'm like, I got adequate sleep, but I feel sluggish today. And I don't know why, but I have to kind of honor that and go with it. Right. Yeah. I, I think that once someone has learn to listen to their body and be able to get away from the I shoulds. Mm -hmm. I should work out. I should go for a walk. I should eat a salad and just have lean protein. It's like so it's so freeing. Yes. And I actually really like the aura ring for that because I'm a little bit type A. We're not affiliated with aura ring, but let's just be real. We'll just talk about it. <laughs> I have one too, Kelsey. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's so it's so gratifying as a type A person to see the metric and say, wow, I didn't sleep very well last night, or my readiness score, like that's their score on Aura Ring is lower today. So I can take I can give myself permission to skip my workout and say not today, because today I clearly need something else. Exactly. You know, and it's funny that you say the elemental diet too, because I've had clients go through that. And it's a freaking nightmare. But, and especially if it if SIBO comes back because we didn't do the actual work. Right, uh, right, right, right. Which is like a whole nother know, conversation we could have at another whole, time, right? <laughs> yeah, a whole nother conversation. But I think that what that reminded me of is just conversations that I've had kind of more as that metabolic coach in terms of the traditional sense, metabolic coach, right? Yep. Um, I've had clients that start adding exercise because they get more energy. And this, this might sound like, so well, not to you, it won't sound crazy, but I had, I had a client recently actually who never worked out, didn't work out, came on with me. I gently pushed in the direction of let's just start getting walks in, having some sort of activity. She started feeling incredible, amazing. I love this. And I actually really like working out. So she decided that she was going to sign up for a 5k she start. this woman had in issues with HPA axis dysfunction, hypothalamus, pituitary adrenals, her adrenals were a little offline, they were taking a nap. Yeah. And so for her, when she added this 5k training, guess what happened? She tanked she, even more, right? She tanked, she tanked, and she gained weight. Yeah. So she she was losing, 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 losing weight, because we were increasing calories, actually, because she was taking in a minimal amount of calories. When we started, we increased calories very slowly, you have to be careful about doing that. Mm -hmm. And so she started losing weight when she increased calories. Of course, it makes sense to us as coaches. And then when she added the stressful event, of training for a 5k, she started to gain weight. And the week that I told her, I'm gonna need you to stop running was the week that she started losing weight again. Isn't that crazy? So it's just crazy. Yeah. And we, we, 
to to an average person or even to coaches even that we're doing this for a living, it can feel so mind blowing. But it makes sense because if we're adding too many stressors onto the body, the body's going to say, hell no, thank you. Bye. Now I'm panicked and I'm just going to hold on to body fat because that's what I do when I'm panicked. Exactly. No, it's so great that you brought this up. It's funny because one of the mentorship programs I did, this was like probably 18 months, 24 months ago, was um, through Sachin Patel. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, Kelsey, but he's up in Canada. He's got a pretty large following of functional practitioners, but he his kind of signature process that he started with and now his wife runs it actually is like, I can't remember if they call it metabolic reset. It's something like that. But one of the core oh. principles they use is exactly what you just described. It's it's the idea that for people, and it's marketed to people who have literally tried everything under the sun, so they think, right? And also have potentially worked with trainers or other, you know, nutritionists that maybe just don't have as deep a handle on all this, and they've still failed. And so it's kind of like their next last ditch effort. And so their metabolic reset program has very strict instructions for like all of the participants, like from go, it's like, all you will do for the first two months of this program is walk. You can strength train, but no hardcore cardio. And it's like, so interesting because again, like what do we see on TV commercials? It's people burning it up on the treadmill. You you just talk to like randomly pull 10 people that you meet on the sidewalk. It's like, what do you think the best way to lose weight is? Guaranteed those people are going to be like, well, you start jogging or something to that effect, right? Like that's just this kind of, you know, balls to the walls gym culture that I think we as Americans have in our head from, you know, probably just TV shows, commercials, you know, what the neighbor person thinks we should be doing, right? Like, and it isn't like people don't understand that stress hormones are on overdrive for so many reasons nowadays. A lot of people aren't even in touch with how ramped up their stress responses. And we get adjusted, we get adapted, right? Like it becomes normal to feel like you're in fight or flight on some level all the time. And so I think so much of what we try to do is dispel these myths, try to get people more in tune with like, okay, like this is actually how it feels to be anabolic, to not have those stress hormones like elevated all the time. This is how, and then I'm guessing this client you just spoke of probably is starting to get better body awareness around if she were to go out jogging, I would imagine you do that now, she's going to start to feel the difference. Like, holy crap, I think I'm actually in a higher stress state. I better like back it down again, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of times people can tell because there's usually a crash at the end of some type of workout that's too much. And yeah. I, you, we can't say that for everyone because I don't want somebody to be listening to this right now and be like, I don't get the crash, so I'm good. Yeah, But I think that what we start to see is we start to see people normalizing this intense workout, like HIIT training, right? Mm -hmm. High intensity interval training is such a trend in America right now and has been for the last, I feel like at least 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, we are getting the most out of our workout. We are getting the most calorie burn. I worked so damn hard for that hour. And I do that three, four, five, six days a week or every day. Heaven forbid someone works out every day, right? But like, yeah. these are the things that we start to normalize and we almost wear as a badge of honor. I really truly believe that people wear their stress like a badge of honor saying, I am so busy. I have so much on my plate, but look at me do it anyway. I do it anyway. And I stretch myself so thin because I am like Superman or Wonder Woman or whatever, mm -hmm. and I can handle it. But what we don't recognize until it's too late, because we don't see the symptoms until it's too late, is like, oh, suddenly five years from now, my body's in pain. I'm not sleeping. My libido's gone. My hair's mm -hmm. starting to fall out. And I have no energy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but nothing happened. It came out of nowhere. It didn't. It didn't. But as that five years progressed from you going balls to the wall with HIIT training every damn day to starting to have symptoms, you were slowly pulling out all of these beautiful flowers that were in your garden until you have a barren wasteland. You yeah. just didn't see it because you were faced in the other direction and you were wearing your badge of honor. You know, it's just that is such a common thing in 
today's society. And it makes me so sad because somehow we need to change the narrative. Did you find this episode informative and helpful? I'd love to have you leave me a five-star rating. Do you have questions about holistic approaches to optimizing gut health that you'd like to ask? Please leave your question or comment below and I will be sure to address it personally or cover it in a future episode. Be sure to check the show notes for any resources mentioned in today's episode. See you next time.